Hey, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to today's uh, Oticon talk, proudly sponsored by Oticon. And uh, the speaker today is uh, Anne Marie Dickens Dickinson. Now, yeah. Right, I was going to say Hamilton. Now you changed your name halfway through your PhD. Yeah, that's right. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, Anne Marie's uh, coming to the end of her PhD, which was uh, supervised by uh, Kevin Monroe and uh, Richard Baker. And you were funded by Phonak? Yeah, Did you do this research? Yeah. Okay, great. And it involved uh, frequency compression hearing aids, uh, examining the predictors of benefit to hearing aids, and whether training might be helpful in increasing benefit from hearing aids. So it sounds like a quite an interesting talk. Thank you. Thanks. Brilliant. Um, so I just appeared really at the university about a week ago because I've been on maternity leave. So I've been at home looking after this little man here, so I just wanted to put one little picture on him. But he's 10 months now, so I'm back here part-time, and I'll be here till the end of the year finishing my project. So there's two streams, really, to my project, one of which is the frequency compression and one of which is the auditory training. And I'm not going to go into the background today because I don't have a lot of time. So I've just pointed to a few key studies that if the students were interested, they might want to look at. And particularly this one at the bottom is a new one. It only got published yesterday in the IJA, and it's got a really good review of the evidence behind frequency compression. Um, so it could be, could be a good one to read. So in terms of my PhD research questions then, these are the two questions that I'm trying to answer. And the gap in knowledge with frequency compression is actually fairly large. So the aids have been used for quite a few years in clinic and I was using them before I came in 2009. Um, but the evidence base is huge. So there's probably there's 10 peer-reviewed published studies um, and about two thirds of those have shown some benefit when using the frequency compression compared to using conventional amplification. But the benefit tends to be in the outcome measures that focus on um, high frequencies, so detection tasks, consonant recognition, um, tends to be quite um, specific outcome measures that show benefit. And other outcome measures, like using sentence material or words material, don't tend to find such a good outcome. Um, also, the studies today have tended to use one type of hearing loss. So everybody in the study would have a mild to moderate hearing loss or a severe to profound of the implant users or a steeply sloping. So it's quite difficult to <coughs> predict from those studies which type of hearing losses get most benefit because it's not always easy to compare methods. So the outcome measures are different, the fitting rationale is different, how you fit, fit the frequency compression is different. So it's still quite difficult to assess which type of hearing losses might get most benefit. The, Talk I just, um, the um, paper I just talked about, the Hopkins paper, was an MSc project that was done a year before last with Catherine Hopkins and myself, and that did look at different hearing losses, but in a clinical setting. So there was some evidence there that people with more moderate hearing losses, particularly at 2 and 3K, did get more benefit from frequency compression. But there was also some evidence that people with more severe to profound hearing losses didn't get the audibility that they needed from the frequency compression because the settings were so conservative. So the default software settings tend to be um, quite mild for the severe Um And then in terms of the auditory training, this is a question that's been put forward an awful lot in the literature. Would training improve outcome with frequency compression aids? And the reason that's been put forward is that because frequency compression alters the speech sounds, it, it, sort of adds a distortion, if you like, to the high frequency speech cues, would a period of training help people to adapt to the sound? And it makes sense that it would, and a lot of the time when people haven't found benefit in their studies, they've said that perhaps it's because people needed training or needed some sort of extra help to acclimatise to the new sound. Um, but it hasn't been tested, so there hasn't been a study that's looked at this before. So my PhD, I split it up into three studies, and the first study, um, it's been done and completed, it was with normal hearing adults and the um, manuscript has been written and it was resubmitted after minor amendments yesterday, so hopefully that will come out soon. Um, and the next two studies, these are the studies that I worked on before I left, so I was collecting data for these studies right up until I left really, I think I had about eight days to go before I was due to have Reese. So it was a little bit um, of a close call, but then he was late, so it was fine. Um, so the, today I'm going to talk about study two particularly, because we did some analysis on that research before I left. Richard helped me to, to get some analysis done quite quickly. Um, but I'm going to talk about the methodology for both, because they do work together, really. They do sort of combine together, because they were done concurrently. 
So study two, the frequency compression evaluation, was a within subject design. So the subjects went through all the steps shown on the left-hand side of the flow chart, and it's called an ABA design, so it means that for each subject you can compare the performance when frequency compression was off compared to when it was on. Um, and you, you average the two A's, this is the beginning and the end period, and that's to try and um, account for acclimatisation, test retest effects, sort of that they might get better as they go through because they get more used to the hearing aid. Um, the study three was a between group design, so in actual fact study two became a control for the people that did the real training in study three. Um, the real training I should add was devised from the results of study one, so I used the training methods I'd use for my normal hearing adults and I combined that into a um, automated laptop program. So they took it home and they did it in their own time. Um, and in order to control adequately for training so that there wasn't perhaps a placebo effect just because they had some sort of training, some sort of intervention, the control group were given a sham training, which was very basic, a talking book, which they took home and listened to, just to try and control for the effects of, um, the effects of training potentially. So the study two is actually very long. You can see there that it was four months plus the screen and the hearing aid fitting, which I would try to do on consecutive weeks, but that wasn't always possible because of wax, ear molds, holidays. Um, I think a lot of older people now go on really long holidays. <laughs> So it was quite hard to uh, fit the study in and sometimes it would take six months to get people through that arm of the study. So that was quite challenging, um, whereas study three was a lot quicker to get people through. Um, it was a lot neater if you like. So the study measures, this was quite difficult to choose. It was quite hard to decide which output measures I was going to pick. Um, and mainly that was because I, I couldn't have a test training overlap, so whichever test, whichever speech material I used to train, I couldn't then use to test. And you need a lot of speech material for training because these people are doing it for half an hour a day, well it's 10 hours in total. So the training material was IEEE's and BCB's, which, um, which meant that they were excluded. And I think when I chose my study measures, I wanted to sort of work on a... Um, sort of the theory that a lot of people say so frequency compression should improve the audibility of the high frequencies. So first of all I wanted to see, well is that the case? Do people detect high frequency phonemes better when they've got frequency compression on? That's like the first stage if you like. But then you have to think, well does, does that actually mean that that improves their recognition of those high frequency sounds? So then I looked at the recognition thresholds. And then you could argue that well maybe you need to use more real world type speech material. So then I wanted to see how they coped with words and the FAF is actually a very good test because it's a closed set test, which means it's slightly easier for participants with severe and profound hearing losses to do. Um, and the ASL sentence in noise test was um, to give a more real world situation, people listening to speech sentences in noise and it was open set. So that brings me on to the second reason why it was hard to pick the outcome measures. Because I had a range of hearing losses in the study, I had to make sure everybody could do the same test, otherwise I wouldn't be able to compare performance between the different hearing losses. So that was quite a challenge and it meant that the detection task and looking at thresholds and looking at SRT made it easier. For the FAF test I had to alter the presentation level depending on the individual but use the same presentation level through the rest of the study. Um, so that was another sort of challenge. And I also have to be careful about the time. So um, for some of the study sessions you'll see from the earlier slide people were coming in to be tested frequency compression on and off so I had to make sure the test session didn't become too long and drawn out. I had to consider how long I had to test these participants in the clinic so I tested in four centres, three centres sorry, three NHS clinics and I only had the room for a certain amount of time for a certain amount of months and I had to make sure that I'd be able to finish the study within that, that time schedule really so those were the things I sort of think, thought about when I was doing the study measure and then I thought about some other effects that I just wanted to measure during the study and because the two studies run side by side, I had to make sure the same outcome measures were used in both studies. So I'm going to talk about study two, which is the one that I looked at. Um, I looked at the results briefly before I left. <coughs> so this is just a summary of the participant information. The audiogram shows you the range of hearing losses I had in, which the maximum is um, shown by the green and the minimum hearing loss by the red, and then the mean and the standard deviation. It did tend to be older individuals that volunteered, I think because they've got more time. Um, 
And I made a note of factors like how long we use hearing aids, well they had to be experienced users of hearing aids because they didn't want to have to worry about any acclimatisation effects and they had to use their hearing aid regularly. So initially I asked them about their self-report use and then I also measured it and it was quite interesting that that was very, very different <laughs> um, what was measured and what they actually reported. But, um, but I've got that data that I can use when I do the analysis. So in terms of the phoneme detection tasks then, I've, I've done these graphs so that the grey area in the middle is the period where frequency compression was on. So, and this is a detection task, so we'd expect the detection to get better if we expected to see a benefit from frequency compression, therefore we'd expect the thresholds to go down in the middle and dip back up again. And the detection task used two phonemes, that spinish, which are high frequency phonemes, but they also had a low frequency and high frequency sort of version to reflect male and female voices potentially. So you can see that for 3 kilohertz, there isn't really much of an effect, it's quite similar. For 5 kilohertz, that effect perhaps is starting to develop for some participants, although it's, it's quite similar whether frequency compression is on or off. But for the higher frequency phonemes, for the two sounds, that became more pronounced. So people did detect the sounds a lot better when the frequency compression was turned on. If we look at the recognition task, it's not so clear. The phonemes were quite hard to recognise, I'd say, because they weren't a very natural sound. So people did struggle with this. Um, so these are the two low frequency phonemes. And then the pattern starts to emerge for some people when you look at the high frequency S phoneme, um, potentially. So the FAF word test, and there was two parameters I could measure with the FAF word test. One was percent correct, and one was reaction time as a secondary measure to see whether even though people scored the same, did they take uh, less time when the frequency compression was on, so was it a bit of an easier task for them? Um, again, it's in order, so you can see the red boxes are where frequency compression was on, the white boxes are where it was off. Um, and there doesn't seem to have been much effect. This is the whole group as a whole now, so the 21 participants with a whole range of hearing losses. So we'd expect, perhaps if frequency compression was going to show benefit, that the scores would be higher when it was on and the reaction time would be quicker. We've done one preliminary split, really, where we split them into the mild, moderates, and severe profounds um, to see whether that showed any effects or any effects from the frequency compression, but there doesn't seem to be any there from what we can see. But there's a lot more analysis I can do yet based on the audiograms and the, um, the high frequency thresholds and the slope of the hearing loss. And also the FAF test has a lot of different measurements to do with place, voice and manner scores and, and different errors, so there's a lot more analysis I can do with the FAF test yet. So the ASL sentence test, um, this is the whole group as a whole, so 21 participants, and we did an ANOVA to check um, whether there was a significant effect of condition or session, you can see the results at the bottom, so um, as it's SNR, the lower the better, so you'd expect perhaps when the frequency compression was on that it might improve things, and you can see particularly that first session two and three that's where the drop occurs which is surprising really because you might imagine that people would take time to adapt to frequency compression and they might improve on the last test session perhaps um, and this is the data as a whole and then when we split it into hearing losses the effect was actually present for the severe to profound group rather than the mild to moderate so um, which suggests that perhaps the severe to profound got more benefit but again there is a lot more analysis to do um, in terms of the hearing loss, and that's something I might talk about at the research book, which I'm doing in a few weeks. So my next steps really are that I need to finish the analysis of study two, looking at specifically at the hearing losses and how that interacts with the speech test results, and trying to um, get more information from the speech test results as well and then I'd like to write a paper on that one, and then I need to look at study three results, which are the training results, to see how the uh, performance with training compared to the control group. Um, I'd like to attend an international conference this year so I can discuss this work, and then hopefully I'll finish, well, I should, we'll finish the PhD at the end of the year. Um, so that's sort of my next steps, really, with this project. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to say. I was going to add for the students really that this technology is something that's used an awful lot in clinic now and when you go out into placement or when you finish your course it is likely to be something that you'll come across. So um, 
the Hopkins paper I gave you, the reference, has got a really good review. And because I've been working on this for a long time, if you did want any more information specifically about fitting approaches or settings or anything at all, please do feel free to contact me because I've worked on this for quite a long time, so I feel like I've got a good you know, background of what's happening. So um, if that's something that is useful, please do feel free to contact me. Okay, I think that's it. Questions, anyone? Tim's got one, okay. Can I just ask what yeah. um, fitting approach you use for these few units? Because there's a, there's some there's a process of fan fan out that I've seen. There may be an updated one, mm. which doesn't seem to involve any really measurements for the frequencies that it, that sort of pass the knee point. So you're not really mm. sure whether whether they're actually audible or not. Mm. Would that be something to do with the mild the mild and well, um, the mild the mild ones have ear holes or or the open fit or, or, or whether um, so the mal there was a variation of ear moulds or open fit um, for the mild to moderate ones. So the fitting protocol, the fitting is very difficult to do with a normal hearing aid system, mm. with a normal REM system. And actually, you need some way of being able to see what's happening with the high frequency sounds once they've been shifted to see whether they've become audible. And the only way that I know of that you can do that is to use a system called the Verifit audio mm. scan system, which we've got one here and I bought one for my project. Yeah. Because it's got narrow band high frequency filter signals so you can see when the frequency compression has been turned on, whether that's then brought it into their audible range using speech mapping. So that's the only objective way that I know of being able to check that its frequency compression is working. There are subjective ways where you can use like shh measurements, can they hear it, um, can they distinguish between them, um, but that's quite, you know, it's not measured, it's quite it's, hard to it do. It seems to be a simple thing to do, which is just to basically fit the hearing aid when there's no frequency compression, and then you know that all the gains take into consideration for their acoustics of the canal yeah. and then switch to the switch compression. But you could do but that. that doesn't seem to be in the protocols. So I, I don't understand that. The only problem with that, and I think that's what they do, rec well, in terms of... The Spino seems to recommend just not doing any REMs past the knee point, which doesn't right. make a lot of sense. No, it doesn't. And I think a lot of, most of the research studies that have done this have initially done the REM with it off and matched as well as they can to target. Yeah. But I think the problem you've got is that when the frequency compression is off, you've got this roll off and you've only got a target up to a certain frequency. Yeah. So you can match it up to there, but then you're still not really sure what's happening past that frequency for the higher frequencies. Yeah. So it's more about making sure that the signal that it's mapped in, because once you've got the knee point, things start cutting away. Obviously, as it's squash squashing it. Yeah. But it's more about making sure that the things you're taking from here, from here, and yeah. here, this bit here, are yeah. actually audible. Yeah. And if exactly. you've got no REM information, then you don't know. Yeah. And that's what Phonak is suggesting, isn't it? To, to well, I think the, the protocol I've seen that Phonak, although I don't know if they have updated it, is where they suggest. Um, I thought they did suggest to turn it off, match it as well as you can, and then turn it on, but then not do any verification so, after that. So maybe that's the, there's a different process going on. Mm. Yeah. But certainly that's what I would recommend, and certainly that's what most of the studies have done: mm. is to set, set it off first and then look at it to it's not, <coughs> it's not what I'm seeing in clinics. No, no, it's not done very widely in clinics. Yeah. So whenever I've talked to people in clinics, that's what I've always advised. Mm. But it, it tends to be on because it defaults on. Yeah. And I think people tend to not worry about what's happening beyond the cutoff. Because I even think it's called the wrong name. A cutoff frequency implies nothing's happening above it, but actually, it's not, it's actually that's where everything yeah. is happening. So yeah. that's the really critical area is what's happening above that cutoff. And that's the bit that you need to make sure you know, that information is in the audible range, yeah. that they can hear it. And that, that's what happened with the MSC project. I looked at these fittings in clinic where um, they were just set at default yeah. and they were just set with a rem up to the knee point. And they found that the people were more mild to moderate losses did get benefit because the compressed signal was audible to them because she then looked at the settings with a very fit but she found that the people that didn't have that had more severe to profound setting of hearing losses their compressed signal was way off audibility there's no way they were going to yeah, hear exactly. that signal yeah exactly so yeah. it's an it's unlikely that anybody with a severe profound loss which is fitted who are fitted with the default settings with a rem in that way are going to get a lot of benefit so it's it is an issue really and yeah. It's something I have talked about when I've discussed my work with yeah. your implant department, MRI, and different yeah. people. It's the same with open fit, because open fit, the game can be all over the place. It's a mild loss. It's hard to measure it. Yeah. Time for one more quick question. Yeah. Um, I think it's Jane Hill. Yeah. Hi, Jane. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering what you think about the fitting approach for the high frequency sounds for the high frequency sounds. Like Kevin was about to come up with a really difficult question. That's what happens when you have some trouble on your scratch. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> 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 
Okay. okay. Thanks very much. Okay.